as a civilization, I, I think that, you know, if you roll the dice billions of times uh, on planets around like the earth around other stars, we know that half of the sun like stars have a planet the size of the earth, roughly the same separation. So obviously the conditions we have on earth are replicated in billions of other places. And, you know, Albert Einstein was not the smartest scientist that ever lived since the Big Bang. Uh, there must have been a smarter scientist around another star. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host, Chitendra. This is a conversation with a the theoretical physicist, Avi Loeb. He is a professor of science at Harvard University and a best selling author of the book. Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. In this conversation, we talk about are we alone in the universe? First, interstellar object named Oumuamua. How we can detect alien intelligent life and the Galileo project. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi, Avi. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, so to prepare the podcast, I was going through your affiliations, uh, and it's a huge list. Um, I, I wrote some of them. Um, so you are former chair of uh, Harvard University Department of Astronomy, founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, chair of the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, Chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies and the leader of the new Galileo project. And the list goes on. So, I mean, of course, on one hand, it's inspiring and motivating. On the other hand, which time clock are you following? <laughs> well, um, fundamentally, I'm a farm boy. Uh, I was born on a farm and was very curious about nature. I, I was connected to nature growing on a farm and less so to people. I have no footprint on social media. And all of these titles that you mentioned, uh, um, you know, were a reflection of the fact that I felt an obligation to serve, to allocate uh, some of my time to other people, to solve problems for other people. But uh, fundamentally, I'm really, <laughs> Uh, curious about nature. That's my desire, my passion, to figure out what environment we live in, okay? And uh, at a young age, I was mostly interested in philosophical questions because they are the biggest we can ask about our existence. But then um, I was, uh, circumstances of life led me into physics and eventually astrophysics. And uh, I ended up uh, as a tenured professor at Harvard uh, it looked like an arranged marriage because circumstances led me to that. I wasn't planning to do that. But uh, uh, then I realized that I'm married to my true love uh, because I, I can still ask very fundamental questions and, and address them. And that's really the fun uh, of where I am right now. It's not so much the titles and, you know, the less uh, obligations I have, the better, um, because uh, then I can focus on substance. And one thing that the pandemic did is relieve me from some of the obligations because we were locked at home and uh, then I could uh, create much more. Uh, I wrote uh, of the, uh, over the past uh, year or so, I wrote of the order of uh, more than a hundred uh, commentaries, essays and uh, uh, about uh, 60 scientific papers. So it was a very productive period. And, uh, perhaps it led me to recognize that I should dedicate more of my time to creative work than anything else. But um, this is really what I enjoy doing and thinking about um, what nature is. And uh, right now I'm focused on one question that I think is very important for the future of humanity. And that is, are we the smartest kid on the cosmic block? And of course, a lot of people uh, say yes, uh, uh, thinking anything else is an extraordinary claim. And I say, what you're saying is an extraordinary claim because it's much more likely that we are sort of in the middle of the distribution, that there are many more civilizations smarter than us out there. You know, I tell students in my class at Harvard on the first day, half of you are below the median of the class because in statistics, that's always true in any class, half of the students are 
below the median. And of course, the Harvard students uh, think that they're all at the top 1%. They cannot believe that half of them are below them. But this is also true for us as civilization. I, I think that you know, if you roll the dice billions of times uh, on planets around, like the Earth around other stars, we know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. So obviously, the conditions we have on Earth are replicated in billions of other places. And, you know, Albert Einstein was not the smartest scientist that ever lived since the Big Bang. Uh, there must have been a smarter scientist around another star uh, a billion years ago. And the, the civilization that benefited from that scientist could have sent probes everywhere. And we can find them. You know, in a billion years, they would have reached us any place within the Milky Way galaxy. And the only thing we need to know is look, look through our windows. You see, if we sit at home and say we are the smartest on the block, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and it is, I think, an extraordinary claim that is not warranted. It's much better to be completely agnostic and say, well, you know, what we see around us is probably typical and we are not special in any way. And let's check if there are other kids on the neighborhood. Let's just look through the window and we better use a telescope. Yeah, uh, well, this kind of humility, I think, can only come from a farm boy who is sitting <laughs> even on that, 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 that kind of position, um, which I think it's quite uh, important for uh, if we want to look for another intelligent boys around the corner. Um, so are there um, say uh, intelligent ent entities? I don't know what they are, and they, sorry, yeah. you know, they might very well be girls, and uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and they uh, might be something completely different. But uh, intelligence is important. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, we we uh, one reason I seek intelligence in space is I don't often find it here on Earth. Exactly. But so in in the Previous century, um, of course, the, 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 this equation which came out, it's called Drake's equation, right? Uh, which kind of tried to address that question that how uh, or how many civilizations can be there, um, intelligent civilizations. So what do you think? Where do we stand on Drake's equation now? Right, so I think for 70 years, we used the wrong approach to the search uh, because we were looking for radio signals and for that, uh, you need the counterpart to be transmitting when you are looking. And it's just like trying to have a phone conversation. Um, we can't have a phone conversation with a culture that is not around anymore, for example. And it may well be that there is a very narrow window of opportunity for us to communicate with a radio transmitting civilization because we've been transmitting only for 126 years since Marconi. And that's a short, time, that's a small fraction of the age of the Earth, uh, one in a hundred million or so, you know, and the, the chance that uh, we would uh, find them exactly at the same technological uh, stage as we are is small. Um, but a much better approach than that is to look for any relics they left behind. Uh, so even if they are not around anymore. They could have sent equipment to space, just like we sent Voyager, New Horizon. And you know, these are uh, spacecraft that will leave the solar system. In a billion years, there will be space trash. They will not operate anymore, but they would give um, a sign that we existed, okay? And uh, so when we look in space, we can do archeology. span That's pretty much what I'm advocating for. And I call it extraterrestrial archeology. span looking for uh, relics of other civilizations, just like walking on the beach and among all the rocks that you see that were naturally produced on the beach, every now and then you may find a plastic bottle. And it may well be that, you know, there a lot of them would be trash and not functional anymore, but there might be some that are functional, that are equipped with uh, artificial intelligence and they uh, are seeking some information. And then, um, um, you know, moreover, there might be some leaflets, you know, these are uh, letters or packages that were sent uh, by some distant civilization that could carry an important 
uh, recipe for our salvation. You know, we are destroying the climate. Uh, we are going into wars with each other. And, and that's very unfortunate. And perhaps if we all read some leaflet that was sent by another civilization as a result of their wisdom, uh, we might behave better. And so, you know, it, it would be really tragic if we say, oh, no, we are the only the smartest around and anything else would be an extraordinary claim and we don't have extraordinary evidence and therefore we should stick to our insistence that we are for now the smartest and i i would say you know so people often quote carl sagan as saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence i would argue that he was wrong because extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding you need to search for wonderful things in order to find them. So you can't just say, I don't see anything because you have to look through telescopes. Space is vast, time, cosmological time spans billions of years. So if you're saying, why isn't anyone next to me right now? Well, the region next to you is a small part of the vast uh, interstellar space. And the time that you're looking is a small fraction of the billions of years that uh, uh, of evolution since the beginning of of the universe. So you have to be patient. You have to use instruments that allow you to sample a large survey volume. And in fact, I wrote a, 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 an article just a, a couple of weeks ago about the replacement to Drake's equation. And that equation is um, uh, giving you the chance that if you survey a certain volume around, that you will find uh, a relic from another civilization. And it simply depends on the number of relics per unit volume. And that could depend on the size, you know, because NASA sent a lot of small objects into space. They didn't send any object as big as a football field, okay? So there may be many more small objects. It may also depend on the speed of the object. And uh, in addition, if you use the entire earth as a detector, you know, any object that gets into the atmosphere of the earth from outside, they would burn up. We call these meteors. So that's just like having a fishing net in which you collect objects. And uh, in this case, what you uh, are sensitive to is the number of objects per unit volume times the characteristic speed. That will dictate the rate by which the earth's atmosphere will uh, capture new objects. And uh, uh, I also had, uh, in addition to what I just mentioned, I had uh, another factor in both of these equations. And the factor, I call it the ostrich factor. And that's uh, the fraction of all scientists uh, that are open-minded to do the search. You see, if that fraction is zero, then you will find nothing, which is pretty much what happened until recently. Uh, about half a year ago, we established the Galileo project to search for objects. Before that, there was no scientific project uh, to do that. And uh, of course, if you don't search and you keep quoting Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and we don't have extraordinary evidence, therefore we should not search, then you will not find anything because the ostrich factor is zero. You multiply any number by zero, you get zero. Yeah, this is, I think, fascinating. The so of course the two three things that you mentioned. Uh, so first the the science of the relics. I mean this is this is again uh, extraordinary idea that that we'll be looking for trash in the space basically. Um, and the second thing um, about the Galileo pro project. Both of uh, these points we'll discuss a bit more in detail. But before that, let's talk about the this first sign um, of the of the intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, uh, which is Oumuamua. So what is Oumuamua and uh, what's, what's been happening with, the, with this uh, observation? Yeah, so in 2017, uh, October 19th, um, the first object from outside the solar system was spotted near Earth uh, by a telescope in Hawaii called PanStars. It was given the name Oumuamua, uh, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. And um, at first, astronomers thought it must be a comet because uh, most objects in the periphery of the solar system are rocks covered with ice. So when they get close to the sun, the ice evaporates, 
and you end up with a commentary tale of uh, gaze and dust. And uh, uh, it's very easy to imagine that a passing star could dislodge some of these objects from uh, another planetary system around another star, and then we would see some of them coming our way. Um, but this object was very weird. It didn't look like a comet, even though the astronomers first announced it as a comet, but there was no cometary tail. So it's just like you saying, I saw a zebra, but then upon further investigation, it looks like the, the animal you looked at does not have stripes. Okay, so you cannot call it a zebra. Okay, so then they said, okay, well, it's not a comet. Uh, so maybe it's just rock without eyes, which by itself is unusual because most of the objects that you dislodge from a planetary system should come from the periphery um, and they should have eyes. So at any event, um, as time went on, more and more data came about this object as it was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that meant that it has a very extreme shape. And the best fit to the variation of reflected sunlight was that of a pancake. Um, and then um, uh, a flat object. And then the object uh, exhibited an excess push away from the sun. And given that there was no rocket effect from evaporating gases, the question is what gives it this push? And the only way I could uh, explain it is that the object must be very thin and then it's pushed by reflecting sunlight. And the object was roughly the size of a football field. Um, so um, in September, 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope um, that uh, exhibited an excess push as a result of reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. It was given the name 2020 SO. And then a few weeks later, the astronomers realized that it's actually a rocket booster from a 1966 launch to the moon. So it came from Earth. Uh, and just by extrapolating the trajectory back in time, they could figure it out. Oumuamua definitely came from outside the solar system because it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. It couldn't have come from Earth. Um, and so um, this object, 2020 SO, was thin uh, because it was just the shell of, of a launch and, um, and it had a large area for its mass and that's why reflection of sunlight could push it. Uh, so we know that it's artificial because we produced it. And the question is, who produced Oumuamua? Yeah. So the, and this 2020 SO um, also had a kind of pancake size. Well, it was a cylinder. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we don't know the exact shape of um, Oumuamua. All we know is that the amount of sunlight reflected changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling, okay? So it meant that it had a lot of, uh, you know, when it uh, when projected on the sky, the area that you can see changed by a factor of 10. And, just think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. Um, it's flat and uh, the area that you see in front of you changes, um, but it could well be uh, that the object itself is, is extremely thin like the piece of paper, even though the area that you see projected is only changing by a factor of 10. Yeah, so we, what you are implying here is that maybe that this object, Oumuamua, uh, was created by another intelligent civilization. Yeah, because I could not think of uh, how nature would make a very thin object like that. Um, and um, so that's, I explained all the anomalies. There are more anomalies uh, that we, I mean, it will take us a little more time to get into, but I described them in my book, uh, Extraterrestrial. And the mainstream of the astronomy community tried to explain. Uh, there was a lot of pushback against my proposal, uh, but um, the mainstream astronomers were trying to find an alternative explanation to the anomalies and specifically to the fact that it was pushed uh, away from, from the sun without showing a cometary tail. So one proposal was it's a hydrogen iceberg, chunk of frozen hydrogen. We've never seen it before. We don't know if nature makes 
a chunk of frozen hydrogen the size of a football field. But they just said, okay, maybe it's a rock of a type we've never seen before, not produced in the solar system. You have to produce it in a molecular cloud, completely different environment. Yet it's the first object that we had seen, okay, from outside the solar system. It must be very abundant. But there is also a problem. The idea was that when it evaporates, hydrogen is transparent, so you can't see it. Uh, and therefore, it's just like a comet, but made of hydrogen. And the problem with that is that hydrogen evaporates very quickly. We show that in a paper, and this object would not uh, survive very long uh, in interstellar space. So then there was another suggestion. Maybe it's a cloud of dust particles, very loosely bound, um, sort of like a dust bunny, so that uh, it's 100 times less dense than air, and it gets pushed by reflecting sunlight because it's so porous, so fluffy. Uh, and the problem with that is when it gets close to the sun, it would not maintain its integrity. It would evaporate. Um, and then there was a suggestion, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg, a chunk of frozen nitrogen chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto. And there the problem is that there is not enough nitrogen ice to make so many chunks, so many chips. Um, so there are challenges. And we've never seen a chunk of frozen nitrogen or a dust bunny or a hydrogen iceberg. So my point was, if it's something we've never seen before, we should definitely contemplate the possibility that it's artificial. These are the best solutions that were proposed by the mainstream. So when the mainstream says, oh, it's definitely not artificial, forget about it. Uh, the alternative that is being proposed is something that we've never seen before. Okay, that's the alternative. You hear people being extremely critical of the artificial origin. They attacked me personally, and they say a natural origin is definitely the case, but the only proposals on the table are of a natural rock that we've never seen before. These are the proposals. And to me, uh, you know, it resembles a situation where there is a, a cave dweller that is used to playing with rocks, finding a cell phone. And of course, the cave dweller will immediately say it's a rock of a type that I've never seen before. But what that should do is uh, provide an incentive to study this, this object better. And, and then, of course, if you press buttons, you can realize that it records your voice, that it's not really a rock. And the same is true about objects like Oumuamua. That should intrigue us. We should leave on the table the possibility that it's, it's artificial. We should not dismiss it and invent stories about things that we've never seen before, because that's not a viable explanation until you demonstrate that it must be that. So I have no problem if we send a camera. In fact, the Galileo project that uh, I, I established and I'm leading, one of the main uh, branches of it is to design a space mission that will come close to the next Oumuamua, the next object that behaves like it. And we can find many more with the Vera Rubin Observatory that will come online in a year or so. Um, and uh, then take a close-up photograph because a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, it's worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. I wouldn't need to write the book. All I want to know is what this object is. And if we had an image, so be it. If it's a nitrogen iceberg, we learn something new. We learn about objects. We learn about nurseries that make objects the great abundance that are quite different than what we've seen so far in the solar system. So it's definitely an, an important addition to our knowledge base about what our cosmic neighborhood is like. But if it turns out that it's artificial in origin, that would be a huge um, uh, revelation for us, because um, then the question is, what is this uh, civilization that sent it um, about, uh, and what the intent was, and, and so forth. And we can speak more about Oumuamua, but there was another thing that happened over the past uh, year, which is the report delivered by the Director of National Intelligence to the US Congress about objects in the atmosphere of the Earth that are, whose nature is unclear. Oh, fascinating. So the um, so about the Oumuamua, I just had one question. So the uh, the cell phone. So you think, or uh, do you think that this cell phone is active cell phone, or it can be a part of cell phone which 
or it's uh, like the relics that we were talking about? Well, there could be different types of objects. Most likely it could be space trash, not functional anymore, given the billions of years that passed since it was sent. It really depends on whether other civilizations sent, uh, for example, self-replicating uh, devices that uh, just like biological systems can go places and replicate themselves. Because if, if they send things like that, uh, they would dominate the statistics. But if they send things like Voyager or New Horizons that we send, after a billion years, these devices will be defunct. So space would be full of trash, mostly. Um, but there is also a possibility that they sent equipment, uh, even if it's not replicating, it's um, intelligent. It has artificial intelligence, learns, learns uh, from uh, experience uh, through machine learning, and uh, therefore is trying to fulfill some task. And uh, until we collect more information, we can't tell uh, what an object is. But it's really important um, to realize that um, you know, if we were to detect um, a radio signal from another star, then uh, we have plenty of time to decide how to respond. And that, that is pretty much what people thought about in the past. The protocol for a response to a radio signal, you see that you know, in movies and so forth. Uh, the thing is, the nearest star to us is four light years away. So it takes like four years to travel the distance. And uh, most of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy are tens of thousands of years uh, away, light years. Um, so uh, we are under no um, uh, rush or urgency to respond. Okay, and but if you find a visitor in your backyard, you have to decide immediately what to do about it, especially if the visitor is intelligent, because you need to figure out what its intent is and what um, how much of a risk it is, and. Um, one thing we need immediately to decide on is who represents humanity. There needs to be an organization that decides what to do. Uh, currently, there is none. And I'm worried, frankly, that even if we had such an organization, there would be a lot of humans that will decide to do whatever they want. Uh, and uh, that could um, put us at risk if they engage with an object in an irresponsible way. The entire of humanity. I mean, it's not a national security threat. If it came from outside of this earth, it has nothing to do with borders between nations. It's a, a scientific matter that uh, should be shared by all humans. And um, we haven't thought about the possibility of what to do if there is an intelligent piece of equipment near us from another star. Yeah, so the, um, because what I was thinking is that the, uh, the fact that it accelerated after a kind of bouncing uh, or getting the energy from the sun, um, from there, can't we kind of predict whether, whether um, you know, that speed was achieved by the activeness of the equipment uh, rather oh, than... Uh, yeah, uh, but the, actually the, so the reflection of sunlight just pushed it at a very small force compared to the force of gravity. It was, you know, less than a percent of the force of gravity. So it, it, the trajectory was primarily dictated by gravity. Uh, and then there was this additional force that was detected beyond any reasonable doubt. Uh, and that led me to suggest that it, it may very well be thin enough to be pushed by reflecting sunlight. So just like 2020 SO uh, that had thin walls, that's all you could say. Now, whether that was useful for propulsion, probably not because gravity was still most important. But you can also imagine a piece of equipment that would shut off all engines when it comes to the habitable zone of a star just to avoid any risk. Um, and it will behave, masquerade as uh, just a rock passing by. Uh, however, if it's very thin, it cannot avoid, you know, the little, the very small uh, nudge that it gets from reflect, reflection of the starlight. Um, so if I had to guess, you know, this object was probably not functional if it is artificial in origin. And it could be, for example, a leaflet. 
imagine a civilization that wants to write to send letters <laughs> announcing its existence or some advice that it wants to give and a, a leaflet would be a thin object on which uh, some message is written so uh, it would appear just like Oumuamua it would uh, be thin and, and lightweight and uh, pushed by reflecting sunlight um, so the key is really to get more data on a future object and for me it was a wake-up call okay so uh, that changed my sense of priorities on what I want to allocate time in terms of my research and to establish the Galileo project, because even though I'm a theoretical physicist or astrophysicist, um, I think that in this context, uh, it's not a philosophical question. We just need to look out and figure out the answer. Uh, and uh, we can argue forever where, whether we are the smartest in the universe. But that will not resolve uh, the question. It's just like my daughters, uh, when they were young, they stayed at home and they thought that they are the smartest until we brought them to the kindergarten. So the key is really to go to the kindergarten, just go around and see who is else out there. And if we sit at home and claim we have no neighbors, you know, we will never find them. We need to look through our windows and we better use telescopes. So about the Galileo a project so what new you are bringing with that setup um it's like new kind of technology new teles telescopes so the galileo project has two branches one is to design a space mission that will come close to an object like Oumuamua and collect more data on it and in principle in addition to coming close with a camera you can also use uh, new observatories like the james webb space telescope to learn about the object something we didn't have when Oumuamua passed by. Um, so that's one branch of the Galileo project. Um, and, and also, of course, identifying those objects in the pipeline of data that will come from the Vera Rubin Observatory. That's, that's another aspect that in order to find out uh, which object to focus our attention on, we need some software that identifies objects that are weird, do not have a cometary tail, and behave similarly to Oumuamua. Um, and the second branch of the Galileo project is to explore the nature of objects in the Earth's atmosphere or surrounding it, very close to Earth, uh, because the US government delivered a report. Um, the director of national intelligence wrote a report to the US Congress uh, back in on June 25th, 2021, in which uh, uh, the intelligence agencies admitted there are objects they cannot really understand. I mean, and if these objects were suspect of belonging to an adversary or another nation that are human made, they would not uh, make a public statement about it because it would either be secret or uh, disadvantageous for them, to, for them to, to admit that because they, it would mean that they are not doing their job. Okay, they, they're supposed to figure out if other nations are spying on the US. Uh, so they they put it out and it was uh, from the data they have, they cannot conclude the nature of these objects. And around the same time, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, said that scientists should be engaged in trying to figure out what these objects are. And I immediately submitted the proposal to NASA, but um, they didn't get back to me. And then uh, a few multi-billionaires uh, visited the porch of my home. They were inspired by my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, and decided to give me $2 million which, to my research fund, which I'm uh, now using to uh, fund the Galileo project. And uh, a month after this uh, report was delivered to Congress, we announced the Galileo project that has two branches, one indeed to identify objects like Oumuamua, and the second is to figure out the nature of objects like those mentioned by uh, the director of national intelligence. And the way we do the second task is by uh, building new instruments, um, new telescope systems on the ground that will monitor the sky because the sky is not classified. And the idea is that we will take a video of the entire sky at all times in the infrared, visible light, uh, audio, radio, and uh, use uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, software to figure out the nature of objects. So if 
you know, we see a natural object that would look like a bird or a lightning in the atmosphere or a meteor, then um, it's not of great interest to us. If we see a human-made object like a drone or an airplane or a satellite, again, it's not of great interest. I mean, I know that in both categories, there are people that are focused on studying such objects. There are zoologists that study birds, for example. There are national security officials that study drones manufactured by other countries. You know, that obviously is of interest to them but not for us as scientists. What we are trying to figure out is whether there is anything else. And if we don't find anything else, so be it. You know, we still did an important service to society because as of now, uh, the public is left to speculate and the scientific community ridicules this subject. That's not a healthy situation. So the Galileo project will build telescope systems monitoring uh, what is on the sky. And I, I should explain that, existing observatories of astronomers, they ignore anything nearby. If a bird flies above an observatory, it's ignored by the astronomers. We will focus on those and try to figure out their nature because they move a lot on the sky and astronomers usually focus on things that are very far away that are not moving, um, relatively speaking. They're moving, but very slowly on the sky. Um, so um, so we will build the first telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory in the coming months. Uh, ho hopefully it will be operational by the end of the summer of 2022. And once we are happy with it, we will make copies of it. And the number of copies will depend on how much funding we have. Currently we have $2 million. We can make about five to 10 such uh, copies and put them in different locations. But what we really need are hundreds of copies uh, based on the statistics of reports uh, from the government. So we hope to get funded at 100 million. And that is not a lot of money for a scientific project. Uh, we are following the scientific method. You know, it's just like a fishing expedition. We don't assume anything. This is not a lot because, for example, the Large Hadron Collider or the James Webb Space Telescope were projects that they required $10 billion. And we need just 1% of that to accomplish the task. And given that it's of great interest to the public and to the government, I think it makes a lot of sense to pursue it. Yeah, and what about the scale of the um, objects or relics? I mean, I, I can imagine that there can be smaller uh, objects as well. Um, so how, right. how would we manage that? So the... Panstars telescope in Hawaii uh, was constructed such that uh, it will find objects bigger than the size of a football field, bigger than about 140 meters um, uh, within the orbit of the Earth around the sun through the reflection of sunlight. And that was a reflection of uh, uh, the US Congress asking NASA to identify 90% of such objects that may hit the Earth. Because we know that uh, 66 uh, million years ago, the dinosaurs were very proud of themselves. They were eating grass and uh, dominating their environment. But one thing they didn't do is build telescopes to, and look at the sky. And as a result, a giant rock the size of Manhattan Island hit the ground and tarnished their ego trip. So, uh, what we want to do is prevent such an outcome uh, and uh, look at the sky for any object that may collide with Earth and cause some even a rather small catastrophe. Uh, so the size of a football field is about a percent of the size of the rock that killed the dinosaurs. But um, the Panstars Observatory was the first survey telescope that was monitoring the sky with uh, sensitivity to such objects and it found Oumuamua. And the, the Vera Rubin Observatory will find about 60% of those objects and it will be much more sensitive. So, um, and it could find smaller objects uh, maybe down to the size of uh, tens of meters. Um, and uh, there is another way to find interstellar objects or objects that uh, come close to Earth, and that is using the Earth itself as the fishing net. As I was mentioning before, uh, an object will burn up in the atmosphere and become a meteor. And um, that 
the detection of meteors is not relying on the reflection of sunlight. There is a fireball that is produced by the object burning up in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air. So uh, you can see that uh, fireball, it's very bright. And uh, th that allows uh, us to detect objects as big as a human, you know, just a meter or so in size or even smaller. Objects that are smaller than the size of a human just burn up in the atmosphere, nothing is left. Objects bigger than the size of a human uh, leave something behind that you can find on the ground. And, and it's interesting to ask uh, whether any of these meteors uh, could have originated from outside the solar system. And we found such a thing from 2014 with my student Amir Siraj in a catalog that the government released. And uh, the advantage of identifying interstellar meteors is that First of all, you go to sizes that are much smaller, as we you were asking about the size. Here you can detect something of the order a meter or even smaller. So and that resembles the kind of uh, uh, spacecraft that, that NASA sent out. And so you know it would be interesting to see if someone else sent such things. And we can figure out whether it came from outside the solar system by the velocity that it enters the atmosphere. We can extrapolate it back and, and figure out whether that the object was bound to the sun or not, whether it, if it moves fast enough, then it couldn't have come from the solar system. So um, um, the advantage of a meteor is that um, if it's big enough, bigger than a person, then something is left on the ground or in the ocean, and then we can put our hands on it. So just imagine an interstellar meteor that lives uh, a relic on the ground and you can go there and check it out and uh, especially if it's artificial you know we could examine it in the laboratories that would be fantastic so that, that is in terms of the sizes that we can probe in answer to your question yeah uh, i mean this is amazing because then we can also kind of start exploring geochemistry of these meteorites and start understanding how um, the the chemistry out, outside our solar system exists. So, looking at the response from the scientific community, do you think that we are not ready to meet uh, a, another intelligent civilization yet? Well, as of now, I would say that um, we prefer to live in a virtual reality that flatters our ego. And that was true for millennia. You know, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that we are at the center of the universe and people believed him for a thousand years until Copernicus and Galileo argued otherwise. And when Galileo said to the philosophers of his time, look through my telescope and you realize that perhaps the earth moves around the sun. Uh, they said, no, we don't need to look through a telescope. We know the answer, the earth is at the center. And by the way, you are under house arrest. Uh, so they didn't want other people to listen to him. And today they would have canceled him on social media. And the point is that it doesn't really matter what those philosophers thought. What matters is whether the earth moved around the sun or the sun moves around the earth. And if you were to ask those philosophers to design a spacecraft that would reach Mars, they would never accomplish that task because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth. So they would shoot it in the wrong direction. So my point is reality is whatever it is. It's not a popularity contest on Twitter. It doesn't matter how many people like the idea. And frankly, if the Galileo project finds an object that is of extraterrestrial technological origin, I will not need to go around and convince people. I don't care about it. I just want to know the answer. And uh, eventually people will come to recognize it because anyone with common sense that sees a high resolution image that shows bolts and screws and maybe even a label saying made on exoplanet Y would agree that it's not a nitrogen iceberg or a hydrogen iceberg or a dust bunny, okay? So people can still claim those things and say, forget about it, let's move on as long as we don't have good data. And by the way, they would prefer that we don't have good data so that we don't have to worry about it. Uh, one of the experts on rocks in the sky that is a colleague of mine, you know, there was a, a lecture at Harvard about 
uh, Oumuamua, and when we left the auditorium, he told me, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And that kind of attitude is the opposite to what a scientist should have, because if nature shows you an anomaly, something that you didn't expect, then it's actually thrilling. It's an opportunity to learn something new. But to an expert, it's a threat because an expert maintains the image of being able to explain anything that comes along the way by the past knowledge. But guess what? If you look at the history of science, all of the important discoveries came as a surprise. Quantum mechanics was discovered a century ago. It was not expected and it was discovered experimentally. And even Albert Einstein had a problem interpreting it. And today, a century later, just a hundred years, that's all. A hundred years later, the reason that you and I are able to speak is because we have those gadgets that are based on our knowledge of quantum mechanics. Everything we use to communicate right now, the two of us, you and me, is based on the knowledge acquired from quantum mechanics. Can you believe it? A hundred years ago, it was not known. And still, we don't fully understand how it works. It's still a, a, a big puzzle in terms of the fundamental philosophical underpinning of quantum mechanics. Uh, we don't know what the quantum reality is like, because when you do an experiment, suddenly reality changes. Uh, it, you know, so depending on whether you measure the system or not, the system is described differently. And that is a surprise. And Einstein could not really figure out what it means. And he was wrong. He thought that quantum mechanics uh, is, behaves in a way similar to classical physics, but he was wrong. So, um, um, the point is, it came as a surprise. It's still a surprise. We use it to build all the gadgets that are very helpful for us. And it's not something that anyone expected. And uh, just imagine that right now, we would discover something like quantum mechanics, then obviously, people that worked on what is equivalent to qu classical physics would dismiss it, would brush it aside, would say it makes no sense, forget about it. And by the way, it, good data is not enough. There are examples from human history where, for example, the Mayan culture, you know, I visited the Chichen Itza in, in Mexico, and I was really very excited to learn from the tour guide that astronomy was a very uh, important uh, occupation in the Mayan society. That, that was remarkable to me because in our society, being an astronomer is not a high status, you know, but, but for the Mayans, it was. And so I wondered why was it? Turns out that the leaders thought that by knowing the positions of objects on the sky, you can figure out the outcome of a war, okay? So they wanted to have someone that would advise them based on the exact location of Mars, the sun, the moon, and so forth. So they... The, the astronomers were considered astronomers, astronomer priests, and they were at the highest uh, societal status, and they collected exquisite astronomical data uh, at the time. They were the most advanced. Uh, and then um, you ask yourself, okay, so there was a lot of data. What did they use it for? They collected a lot of data, but they used it to forecast the outcomes of wars. They didn't use it to develop general relativity or Newtonian gravity. So collecting a lot of data is not a guarantee to understanding what it means. If you have a strong agenda of saying, anything I find in the sky is rocks, must be natural. Then when you see something unusual, you would say, it's a rock, it's natural, but it's something that I've never seen before. It's a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg, or a dust bunny, case closed, forget about it, don't even talk about anything else. And, you know, that's not a sign of a healthy uh, intellectual culture, because what you want to have is all possibilities on the table that intrigues you, rather than say, I wish it never existed, you should say, 
I'm so glad that there is something unusual now that I can explore farther because maybe nature is telling me something that I've never expected, okay? That should be the attitude, similar to the attitude of a kid learning about the world. And that's why I said, you know, I want to maintain my childhood curiosity because the biggest scar I have for my childhood, the biggest sort of trauma for me was sitting at the dinner table and asking a difficult question. And then the adults in the room would simply dismiss the question because they didn't know the answer. They would say, it's not an important question. And I knew that it's an important question. They just don't know the answer. So why would they dismiss it? Why not say, that's very intriguing. Let's explore it. And so I thought that by becoming a scientist, I have an opportunity to motivate people to think about questions and explore them scientifically. But here I find myself again, you know, like 50 years later, surrounded by the adults in the room claiming, forget about it. Let's move on. It's not an interesting hypothesis. I mean, this is definitely uh, a noble thinking, uh, first of all. The, I think here it's a bit ironical in a way because uh, so on one way, science works where uh, you, you know, pose a hypothesis, you may you know, also get, gather some evidence. And then, uh, of course, you receive a lot of criticism from the people who have gone, um, who have undergone this years of training, basically, right? Um, so it is expected on one hand. On the other hand, I mean, of course, that some sometimes we just uh, become conservatives, like we don't want to see the evidence, right? Well, there are two things I wanted to say on that. One, that um, it sends the wrong message to young scientists because they are worried about job prospects. And if they see that the senior people ridicule any deviation from the beaten path, they will not innovate. And that is really bad for innovation in science. But the other thing is that, um, you know, that we should um, allow ourselves to learn something new as a result of new evidence. And we should invest in anomalies, trying to figure out those anomalies. And uh, what you find instead is in the mainstream of theoretical physics, for example, the prevailing uh, dogma, or I should say the occupation of theoretical physicists is string theory. Now, string theory is already, you know, has been studied for 40 years. It's supposed to uh, unify quantum mechanics and gravity. And not only that it was not tested so far experimentally, but there is no nothing on the horizon that we can see that will test it, okay, experimentally. So we don't know if it's a dark alley, we don't know if it's a good idea about nature. And moreover, when you ask string theorists to make a prediction about a problem that we know exists, at the interface of quantum mechanics and gravity, let me give you two examples. What is at the center of a black hole? They tell me, oh, it's too difficult. This problem, you know, it's too difficult for us to solve. And then I ask him, okay, so what happened in the second context that is of great importance? And that is what happened around the time of the Big Bang. And they say, oh, that's also too difficult. Now, you know, I invited a week ago, I invited the plumber to fix uh, some plumbing problems at home. And suppose I told the plumber, you know, I have a problem with uh, my toilet. Uh, could you fix that? And he would say, no, that's too difficult for me, sorry. And I would say, okay, well, forget about the toilet, but can you fix the faucet because it's leaking? And he would say, no, 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 that's also too difficult. I would say, sorry, you're not a plumber, okay? You need to redefine your job definition. You can't declare yourself as a plumber without solving the problems that you are supposed to solve. And at the same time, argue that you're leading the frontier of physics, which is pretty much what was said for 40 years. Now, this is the mainstream of theoretical physics and the people practicing it give each other awards, they do mathematical gymnastics. Now you ask yourself, how is it possible that such a culture is prevailing? And the answer is because they define the sandbox where they can do mathematical virtuosity and demonstrate that they are smart. And a lot of the work in academia is demonstrating that you are smart. It's pretty much maintaining an image 
rather than trying to understand nature, okay? So it's not out of a sense of modesty saying, we don't know much, let's figure it out through iterations with experiments. It's rather, let's define a sandbox and show that we are smart. And you know, this sandbox can be, for example, how many angels can dance on the tip of a pin? Who cares? Let's define that as an important question and then calculate how many angels can dance on the tip of a pin. And do and if that would be extremely valuable if the mathematics required to answer this question is very involved. You know, if it requires extra dimensions to figure out what you know an angel does, that's even better because the public will not fully understand it, and we will go through mathematical gymnastics and show that we are smart. And so you find this culture in academia at the same time that the possibility of something like us existing a billion years ago around another star when we know that there are so many planets like Earth out there, that is being ridiculed. So I would argue that's much more down to Earth. That's much less speculative. That should be part of the mainstream, much more so than string theory or much more so than some ideas about the dark matter. You know, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. For a century, uh, science was attempting to figure out and we, we just don't know what kind of particles are out there. We know that they exist, they're called dark matter because they don't, they're invisible, but it's rather embarrassing to admit that we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. It's not made of the material that our body is made of or the earth is made of or the sun is made of or comets or asteroids are made of. So it's something else, we don't know what it is. And there were people suggesting various ideas and we've been building experiments to look for those particles for four decades now. And uh, the latest is the Large Hadron Collider that cost $10 billion. And there the opportunity was to find the lightest supersymmetric particle being the dark matter. That was, everyone said that must be the case. That is very likely to be the case. It's worth $10 billion if we do that. And we didn't find it. Okay, so my point is, if we search for equipment, you know, it's a search in the dark, and, and it's not a search in the dark that is more speculative for uh, as the search uh, for the lightest supersymmetric particle. It's, you know, we don't know if, if that particle exists, we didn't find it. So if we invest $10 billion uh, for the next 40 years in searching for technological equipment in space, and we don't find anything, we would be at exactly the same point as the search for dark matter is right now. And that is part of the mainstream. So I'm saying something is really off in terms of the common sense of uh, the academic community. There needs to be more attention to this, uh, to funding the search that I'm talking about because the public cares about it. And it's of great importance to humanity. If we find the dark matter is the lightest supersymmetric particle, what kind of an impact would it have on the daily lives of people? Obviously, on those that discover it, you know, they will get the Nobel Prize, but that's pretty much it. I mean, society will not change. History will not change dramatically. If we find equipment from another civilization, human history will change. So how can we ignore that? It's just incomprehensible to me. Yeah, uh, I think just to respond respond to that, this is the golden era uh, for the science because you know this is important. Like to have this, these conversations um, to a different fields and and kind of try to explain your work, right? Because that just opens your mind. That basically connects you to the other people uh, and brings out uh, what is the importance of your work for the society and humanity. Um, so. So one question that I uh, really wanted to ask you is the, uh, especially for the early career researchers like me, are there any good questions and or bad questions in science? Uh, I don't think there are bad questions. So I think uh, science is about understanding the reality that we live in, and it's always beneficial. Uh, because, you know, for example, if you go back a, a thousand years, there were people saying, uh, the human body has a soul and therefore uh, it should not be dissected. You shouldn't have anatomy. So they argue that anatomy should be banned because you may hurt the soul of the human if you open the human's body. 
Now, that turned out to be the wrong idea because eventually we opened up the human body and we were able to understand the different organs inside of it. And that was very beneficial for modern medicine, right? So if we didn't do that, uh, we wouldn't be able to develop the mRNA vaccine that uh, saved many of us from the COVID-19 uh, virus, right? And um, so this is an illustration of the fact that understanding, for example, in this case, the human body, which is part of reality, by doing experiments on it, it was beneficial because once we figure out what it is, we can adapt uh, our plans accordingly. We can suppose there is a disease, we can try and cure it because now we know what, how the human body works. And the same is true about any aspect of reality. We understand quantum mechanics, we can build gadgets. Uh, if we understand that we are not alone in our neighborhood, we will behave differently, okay? We will try to learn from them. We will try to perhaps uh, adapt our future strategy to the existence of others in our neighborhood. So my point is, it makes no sense to ignore parts of reality and the, or, or to put goggles on your head and believe in virtual realities, you know, the metaverse. Uh, I mean, of course, it brings us pleasure to imagine things that flatter our ego. So in the metaverse, when you put goggles on your head, you can always look good. You can always have a wonderful life that gives you pleasure. But that's not the reality that we all share. Okay. And um, it was true throughout human history that um, people were attracted to virtual realities. And then, um, you know, people would put makeup to hide the pimples of, on their face. And I pretty much want to see the pimples on the face of reality because I want to adapt to it, whatever it is. I'm in love with the reality that we all share. I don't need illusions. And I think that is the main message that science brings, that it allows us to learn about the actual reality that we live in. Sometimes it's to our benefit, sometimes not. But it's good to know so that you adapt to it. If you always believe in a reality that gives you pleasure, then uh, you are probably hallucinating or having some illusions because it's a mixed bag. It should be a mixed bag, but let's figure out what's in the bag. And that's what science is doing. Okay, so the so my other question was with the with this current situation in, in Europe, uh, this war in Ukraine. Um, and as an astrophysicist who is looking at the vastness of, of uh, the universe and which is, I mean, once you imagine it's spectacular, right? And then when you see that humans behaving like, of course, like animals, we are, uh, the, you know, coming from this evolutionary process, but at least we can think of, you know, in past few centuries, we have managed to raise our consciousness. But then these kind of situations happen, which basically not only ruin the progress of science and whatever uh, we are doing, it, it just, you know, people lose that motivation, right? So what's, what's your comment on that? Yeah, so um, if you look at human history, and that's not new about the, the latest war, uh, there, uh, there is a lot of distraction that is triggered by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. And um, the best example is actually the Nazi regime during World War II. It triggered the death of uh, 75 million people, which was 3% of the world population at that time. 10 times more deaths than those triggered by COVID-19. And we've been talking about COVID-19 for two years. Just think about it. A group of people decided to feel superior relative to others. <laughs> and they triggered the death of 3% of the world population. Okay. And um, my hope is that if we find a smarter kid on our cosmic block, it would inspire us um, to regard all the differences between humans as insignificant relative to that smarter kid. And uh, uh, therefore regard each other uh, as equal members of the human species. So that's my hope that we will get back to our senses and realize that if we look up, uh, the environment is far greater and it includes some smarter kids and we better get our act together and cooperate rather than fight with each other. Okay, that's, that's uh, my hope. 
And uh, whether it will be realized or not, it remains to be seen. On the other hand, we can just think that um, on at least on this planet, we know that there is intelligent life and we can be, start behaving like intelligent kids. Oh yeah, so um, part of the realization that we might not be alone, that we should seek others out there is, it will also change the way we think about ourselves, you know, because even before we find someone else, uh, because it changes your perspective. Um, you realize that you are a part of a bigger environment. If you don't find anything aside for yourself in your neighborhood, it makes your life uh, much more precious. You have uh, more responsibility because there is nothing else out there. So either way, whether you find a more intelligent kid or whether you find that it's a ghost town, that there is nothing out there, both ways, it uh, will have a big impact on the way you behave. Yeah, so what is the probability of um, Earth going on extinction, um, humanity going on extinction? So, um, um, it's uh, okay. So, um, when you ask yourself, um, if you select a random day in your life, what's the chance that it's the first day in your life? Well, the chance is one in 10,000 because there are roughly 10,000 days in the life of a, of a person. And um, you just select random day, the chance that it will be the first one is one in 10,000, okay? So now let's uh, optimistically think that our civilization, technological civilization, I'm not talking about primitive versions that existed in past, centuries, but the technological civilization we have started only a century ago with modern science. So what's the chance that uh, if we select, suppose we, we live for a million years, okay? What, and that is an optimistic assumption. What's the chance that we are now witnessing the first century out of a million years? It's one in 10,000. So if I had to guess, I would say, given that we right now go through the first century of our technological development, we only have a few more centuries left. Because if you select a random century in the lifetime of our technological civilization, it's probably somewhere in the middle, okay? So I wouldn't be very optimistic unless, of course, we change course. You know, we can perhaps change the way we behave. But if we continue to behave the way we are, and we already see it in terms of the climate, there are already risks there, but I think they will become very serious within a century from now. So if we continue to operate the way we are, I think we don't have more than a few centuries left. Wow. Um, and so what do you think of uh, uh, space exploration, uh, hum humans being multiplanetary species, etc.? Et I think that's the best uh, uh, way to survive in the long term. Uh, I, I'm not so optimistic about humans surviving anywhere other than on Earth because we were selected by Darwinian evolution to uh, fit uh, to the conditions on Earth. And, it's just difficult for me to re to see how humans would survive long term, you know, more than a few years on the surface of Mars. And it requires a huge infrastructure, and I'm not sure it's realistic uh, because of the bombardment by cosmic rays and the lack of an atmosphere and so forth. There are lots of challenges, but I'm very proud of our technological kids, in particular AI systems, artificial intelligence systems that are used to drive cars and in the future they will be go going to space and be autonomous so I can think of AI astronauts and uh, I have no problem in sending them to represent us rather than sending humans so if I had to wish for something is that our technological kids uh, the AI astronauts will maintain the longevity will carry on uh, the blueprint of our civilization in space and not be subject to all the catastrophes that we have on our planet. And uh, I don't have a special connection necessarily to humans as biological creatures surviving on another planet. I don't, I don't care if that will not be the case. And if we all perish on this planet, 
uh, as long as we have a representation of things that we care about sent out, and we can do it with systems that are far more capable than humans. You know, AI systems could process much more data, and in principle, they could become much more reliable um, in terms of adapting to new environments, in terms of surviving for billions of years in space, much more than the sun. So I would be very happy if humans are replaced by those entities out there in space and they would survive for billions of years. Then what do you think about purpose of humanity or uh, purpose of human life? Well, that's, uh, 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 I think the purpose is really to figure out the meaning of our existence, okay? And then, um, so um, in religious texts, you find often that uh, the origin of everything we have came from God, okay? God created life, God created the universe. Uh, and the thing is that our modern science is almost able to produce synthetic life in the laboratory right now. That's a quality assigned to God in religious texts. We are almost able to do that. And uh, in the future, I can imagine a scientific culture that could uh, might unify quantum mechanics and gravity and find a way to create a baby universe in the laboratory, sort of create a big bang in the laboratory. So if you have a civilization so advanced, much more advanced than we are right now, then it would be a good approximation to God. And then you ask yourself, did life on earth originate naturally? Was it planted by such a civilization? So I think, you know, if we figure out the secrets of creating life out of dirt, you know, and the secrets of creating a universe in a big bang, then it would give a whole new meaning to the way we perceive reality and, um, and the meaning for our life. And that to me is extremely exciting uh, to pursue, you know, and one shortcut we can have is if someone else did it already, so, uh, because they had millions or billions of years ahead of us, if they did it already, maybe we can see the their accomplishments before we need to replicate them. And that would save us some time. That would be a shortcut. So I, you know, I'm really excited about uh, looking out the window and checking who is around. And uh, hopefully in the coming years, we'll, we'll figure it out. So the thought of uh, baby universe is like mind boggling. <laughs> Um, so just to close it or just to conclude the session, um, I have a dream was the famous speech of um, Martin Luther King. So what's your dream regarding astrophysics and humanity? Um, my dream is similar to that of uh, Robert Frost, uh, who had uh, seen two roads. I mean, he has a very famous uh, poem about seeing two roads in, in the woods, uh, and he took the one uh, less taken. Um, the one not taken. And the, the advantage of taking the road not taken is that there might be low hanging fruit. And my hope is my wish, I would not call it a dream, it's a wish, uh, because it can be realized, uh, is that um, once we go in this path of looking for equipment from other civilizations without prejudice, without saying everything in the sky must be rocks, or without saying we are the most intelligent beings and anything else is extraordinary claim, without saying that, just looking out and f finding what's out there, that we will find some low hanging fruit because nobody else did it, okay? And there are reports, there are anomalies. It's not as if we are hallucinating. There are things being said about objects out there that are not fully understood. So. I wouldn't be surprised if within a few years, we will have scientific evidence for things that came from other civilizations and then everything will change. I hope uh, Galileo project would uh, find the low hanging fruits and it would justify the name of the project as well. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation and coming onto the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me.